Good day to one and all. I'm happy to introduce myself to this series of Shakespeare lectures. My name is David Gamble, and I taught for 50 years in humanities, primarily English, drama, history, and such things, uh, for about 50 years in the Ontario uh, system in Canada. Shakespeare was always one of my favorite things to teach. Um, call one cardinal rule, ham it up. It's theater, it's entertainment, it should grab people, and I love performing it and have the and have the kids perform it. We had a great time. My target audiences for this series of lectures are four. First, the senior high school student. Perhaps we can unmuddy things and make the play clearer for those kids uh, struggling with early modern English. Second, uh, those students in perhaps first or second year who may be taking Shakespeare um, might have some pretty serious essays and assignments to do, and I hope some of the language can help them along. Third, I would like to invite the beginning teacher. I remember some years ago uh, what it was like for the first few years. There was never enough time to complete everything you had to do, and so maybe I can find some time for them uh, by sharing ideas and some uh, some of the commentary on the plays. My fourth would be the average playgoer. Friends of mine say, oh, they really like to go and see Coriolanus, but gee, really, I'm not sure. I kind of admit, etc. I hope to clear that up, and I will have one on Coriolanus. Um, and I'm told uh, that they do help the playgoers who are simply getting more money for their tickets, and they're not cheap anymore. So, uh, shall we proceed? So, in order to uh, deal with Lear, um, I would like to give this overview. There is a word I want to start with, and it's very relevant to any tragedy, Lear being one of his finest. So, we have Lear the aging king. He says he's over 80, so... He's getting on. He won't be around much longer. And he will give away and chop up Britain. Britain will be destroyed. He will chop up it into three sections and have uh, each of his daughters take one third and settle their own affairs on that particular parcel of land. And Britain will be no longer an integrated unit. So he wants to do this, but he doesn't want to give up the privileges of kingship. So he wants to be treated as if he still has the scepter, the crown, the throne, and he's going to visit them, and they're going to treat him as your majesty. As, and what? So in order to do this, but it hasn't given it away yet. So in order to do this, he wants protestations of love from each of them to prove that they love him, and he still will be regarded as the king, even though he has given up kingship. He has given up the anointed role, blessed by God. It's sacred. Given that up and wants to retain for himself all the advantages, privileges, and adulation that goes with being the king. Not kingship this time, just him. So this leads to what's, what the classics would call Habartia. Hamartia is the tragic flaw or the error in judgment. He has made a serious mistake and it will lead to catastrophe. That's the nature of tragedy, of course. Uh, Hamlet or, or uh, 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 other tragedies, uh, Macbeth, uh, would show they lead to the dis a disaster at the end and the comeuppance, of course, or the destruction of the protagonist. So he's made this error in judgment. So it spells doom. So the kingdom is dismantled for his ego and the order of nature, and that is the king at the top with the royal family, the nobility, the gentry, the commoners, and the serfs, right? that order is then destroyed because he's taking the top part away. And grace comes from the top because God is at the top and he's broken that chain of being, it's often called. He's broken that chain of order. So he uh, metaphysically has committed a sin. So if I can just hold this up for you, uh, I think you'll see 
All right. So I'll make that clear. Metaphysically, the universe was considered to be a large pyramid, right? God at the top, a single unity, the most perfect and its moral, and the uh, virtue itself at the top. Uh, then you would find in its in, in the order, its uh, pyramidal hierarchical, you would find the angels with their own order. Right with the uh, archangel at the top and then falling, uh, then you get man or human, I should say, pardon me, um, men and women, uh, with again its own order, then uh, animals, then plants. Um, when evil came through Satan, he was an archangel, right? The top, Lucifer, the light bearer, fell down and became furthest from God, the moral order, in darkness and evil. Um, well, I won't go any further with that because it's import important to see, see um, that how this affects the human order. So the kingship, of course, is, a is the responsible position of kingship, and you must obey and you must live up to the demands of that anointed status. So with these, these he he demands uh, these uh, protestations of of love from his daughters, and these ladies have been around court for a long time, so they know what protocol is. And these ceremony, the ceremony, like you think of the uh, coronation and the big carriage and what have you in England, right? These ceremonies elevate us, so everything must be elevated. And this is a ceremony. This is the court. So they trot out their best and finest language and lavish on him all these adjectives and nouns that, that will flatter him. And of course, they'll get, they'll get, whoever does the best gets the biggest chunk. So he, the first daughter, Goneril, the eldest, says to him, she loves him more than eyesight, space or liberty. Really, uh, it, it really is to the point of burlesque. But she knows rituals of court are exaggerated, like coronations, right? With miles and miles of satin and crowns and gleaming diamonds and all the rest of it, carriages. It elevates humanity. She knows what she's doing. The second daughter comes along and says, oh, well, my older sister came short, but I really got something for you, Papa. So she goes on with even more concentrated sugar. And they, that competition forecasts the battle that goes on between them. The one is jealous of the other. One month they fight over a man, they fight over the kingship, they fight over victory. And it, 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 it all this, it be, because the king has broken the line of grace from God down to hu the human, He's, he's, he's broken it by walking away from kingship and saying with the sin of pride, I am it, right? He stopped that flow, that accommodation. So um, the next daughter who was on it says, I love you as a father. That's it. By the rules of nature. That's not enough. You didn't say you were more than liberty itself or whatever or, or compete with Goneril. You're supposed to. So you're not getting anything. He exiles her. So, he expects the luxury without the title, without the, the, without the job. It can't happen. Um, so, he is now actually a commoner. Well, he may be a nobility, but he is not the anointed any longer. That grace, if you will, that sacred position is now gone, but he doesn't want it to be gone in terms of the effect it has on other people. This is, and we're here, here's where you get that meta, that medieval metaphysical order combining with the old uh, classical form of tragedy. This is hubris. This is pride. That too is the cardinal sin. If you look at the, the old catechism, pride is the number one sin and all other sins emanate from it. So you combined for the Renaissance audience that have picked up the classical form, but yet still are very uh, couched in the medieval metaphysical world. You've got the king 
doing this really foolish thing and making Amartya an error in judgment that will ultimately condemn him. So, um, now that the court is corrupted and has lost that grace of God, there are two people at court who challenge him with honesty. I mean, the other, the two sisters are lying like, you know, you lie like a rug. Uh, and they have, they've just trounced it all out as a point of the burlesque. But he, with his vanity, he loves it. He believes it more and more and more. So the, uh, the youngest daughter, Cordelia says, I love you as a father, no more, no less. What would I be with a, when I have a husband to say I love my father with all these absolute um, um, abstract adjectives? That's, and I have a husband? I don't think so. So, And she says that. Um, and the second one is the Duke of Kent, who is his very, 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 very loyal, loyal nobleman who is his at court and he is a truth teller well now that the court is corrupted right with lies he tells the truth what happens to him you're gone he kicks him out and he has to get get out of town in so many days or off it goes his head etc etc so interesting what what kent does he disguises himself hangs around because he loves the king and just because your friends may mess up you don't walk away and say i don't love them anymore it's pride is a human failing and kent knows it but he loves the man has always loved the man and sticks by him so he's, but he tries to reason with him reason and truth are have gone out the window of this court thank you lear so he says as honest Kent, the loyal nobleman who's condemning, condemned for speaking truth warns, thinkst thou that duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows, to plainness honor is bound. If I'm going to speak honorably and honestly, I have to speak plainly, which I did, which basically... Um, to plain dishonor is bound when majesty stoops to follow and you're being a fool, a fool there. So why is the king becoming subservient to his subjects, thereby reversing the anointed order? There it is, Lear. He told you. Point blank. Does he hear it? No. He says, honor demands I speak truth plainly. I'm just kind of retranslating or whatever. So dismissing the, dismissing the war, Lear kicks him out of the country, and, and if he hangs around too long, he'd be off with his head. So, an essential theme of the play is order, which is disrupted by the sin of pride, hubris, leads to a uh, fatal misjudgment, which is giving everything away and expecting to be treated as things were before. They can't be. They're, you've changed them. Uh, and he is, so he is, uh, for the sake of, the, of his uh, ego, he has abandoned reason and order and the grace of God. So are we in chaos? What are we in chaos? We're in, we're in, there is no order. What are we? Just animals who we think don't reason. So without God's grace flowing downward in the chain of being, right? If you remember, God's grace comes down. He's knocked out the line here at the top of uh, the human section, caste. He's knocked it out. The ordained man has renounced his ordination. Cool. So, Shakespeare has, corrupted the, uh, has constructed this moral universe as a hierarchy. What happens to the, the, there's two truth tellers at the court. There's Cordelia as well. So Cordelia, what happens to her? He's a, a favorite daughter. She's a sweet, sweetheart. She's honest. She's pure. She's all the good things. Um, she says, sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. Truth. But loves him as a natural daughter would, according to my bond. So he flies into a rage and he pawns her off to the king of France to make the matter short. And the uh, Kent says, thy youngest da daughter does not love thee least. 
she knows what love is for a father and the others are lying like rugs so off she goes she's banished so Kent defends his bluntness. Be Kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. And here is a harbinger of, of the future. Lear does go mad in, as, as the catastrophe glows, grows. So his growing narcissism will ultimately have him lose his mind and everything else. And ultimately, because it's a tragedy, he's going to lose his life. You know that. And here's a great line that uh, Kent throws out. Do kill thy physician, your physician is truth, and the fee bestow upon the foul disease. You'll pay the disease to grow. Kill truth. You'll pay the disease of lies. Kent says as he exits and off he goes. So one of the themes of the play, and you might uh, follow this all the way through, and it's, it's, it, it comes up with the fool, it comes up often. A core theme of the play is that of truth, which cannot rear its own head in a false court it can't cannot see the truth cannot be spoken when the lies are all accepted so as i have this tragedy truth tellers must travel in disguise they cannot be known as truth they have to be known as something else so kent the banished loyal nobleman who is very high he goes as a plain, a plain speaking common man. And maybe there's some kind of virtue in the common man that Shakespeare often raises, right? Even uh, with the uh, the drunken uh, gatekeeper in uh, in Macbeth, he tells the truth. He often puts the words of truth in the common man. So, the honest Edgar. Here's another story, and I will get to the, the details. There's another character who will be thrown out as the honest man, and that is Edgar. There is a nobleman by the name of uh, the Duke of Gloucester has two sons, and Edgar, the truth teller, he gets thrown out. Co Shakespeare may be commenting very adroitly on human pomp and circumstance, human desire for power, desire to be elevated, raised, whatever, and that falseness that would attend a court or a palace or a, I don't know, parliament. Um, so Edgar, there's three that are thrown out, well, apart from Lear, right? There's uh, Cordelia, the daughter, Kent, right? And Edgar, who shows up on the heath later on uh, wearing nothing. He's absolutely naked, except well, for decency, you put a diaper on him. But that is simply man reduced to only what the physical being is, or human, I should say. Um, uh, Shakespeare always talked about, you know, uh, the older language. Um, so Edgar leaves. Dis it's, it's an undisguised disguise. He goes only as himself, as a naked man. That's a disguise. No one does that. Right, and that's true. So Lear's mad, Lear's madness con, uh, continues, and uh, his situation becomes hopeless. Cordelia goes to France. She'll come back later to try to save him. His kingdom is so corrupted that truth not dare show its honest face. Establishing the theme early in the play, the fool says, "Listen, truth's a dog that must to kennel." He must be whipped out, while Lady the Bratch may stand by the fire and stink, by Lady the Bitch, the Bitch Dog. In other words, the accepted truth, which is not truth, we all enjoy and share in the popular lie, the self-advancing lie. So, and that's Act 1, Scene 4, 107 to 109. So, the King of France takes it, takes it to France. Uh, without her father investing, she is kicked out. There is so once that's set up, there is a, <clears throat> a descent. <clears throat> he quickly learns, O oh, King, that he has made a bad decision. <clears throat> Goneril and Reagan, the vile sisters, swiftly begin to undermine his pretense of authority that Lear still holds. Lear goes insane. The fool. His acerbic truth-teller, 
you know, often there is a, there's there's uh, there's Festy and Twelfth Night, and uh, uh, and there's the uh, uh, the Grave Digger in um, uh, Hamlet, uh, uh, who speak truths plainly. That Shakespeare very good at this common man theme. Explains his calling Lear a fool. He calls Lear a fool. The, the, the fool can say anything he wants because, mind you, the disguise is he's a fool, but he's not. All other titles, this is the title of fool, all thy other titles thou hast given away, that, that is fool, thou wast born with. Act 1, scene 4, 145 to 6. The beginning of his descent, his decline, begins with Gloucester's dismissing his demand for hosting him. Goneril's, I'm sorry, erase that. Goneril, the eldest daughter, he goes to see and he sa and she says, I'm not having you with all these knights here. You get rid of the knights. What? I'm the king. No, you're not, Papa. So the language uh, changes, and you'll notice now the language is no longer speaking of heaven and virtue and blah, 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 but it comes from the bottom. And if you'll notice, too, here you'll see Satan at the bottom, and you've got a varying degrees of devils getting less evil as you go up towards God. And you have the animal just be below the human. And these elements will come up because there's a blockage. The um, So when he gets angry with her, his language becomes really vicious. And he swears by things organic, not by above, but things bodily. So he says to her, after dismissing God's order, he says, uh, into her womb, convey sterility, it's organic, right? Dry up the organs of increase. In other words, make her infertile, sterile. Uh, and later calls her a disease that lies within my flesh, not my soul or my, my, my flesh. So things have become organic only no longer emanating from the heavens. Reagan, when he goes to see her, she, he gets the same treatment, of course. I'm not interested in the old guy. Get rid of all these knights. I'm not interested. Reagan gets the same treatment with, thou art a boil. <laughs> a boil, is a boil, a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle. That's his daughter, second daughter, in my corrupted blood. That's Act 2, Scene 4, 198 to 200. In that area, you'll find lots of it, lots more. In uh, uh, not once does he reach to the higher order and say, may the Lord forgive you for transgressions, honor thy father and thy mother. He's lost that language. It's lower now. So the spiritual is void. He uh, curses procreation, dividing womanhood into two. And listen, no, so now he generalizes to all womanhood. He, this, the misogyny is, is horrifying. So he says about women, and this is Act 4, Scene 5, 120 to 125. Down from the waist, their centaur, you know what a centaur is, human and horse. They're centaurs. The women all above. But to the girdle do the gods inherit. Beneath is all the fiends. That's the sexual organs. There's hell. There's darkness. There's the sulfury pit, burning, scalding, stench, consummation. The hatred in this man as he curses by such vile things. That's at 4, scene 5, 120 to 125. Suffering his punishment, he is now perhaps justly indigent, poor, he has no means of support, and losing his mind. So physically and mentally, he's bereft on a barren heath in a brewing thunderstorm, accompanied by his fool and Kent, ironically, two loyal truth tellers. The court he's abandoned full of, or being thrown out of that's full of lies it is early that she, Lear fears for his own safety I have full cause of weeping and this is act 2 scene 4 261 to 3 I have full cause of weeping but this heart shall break 
In a hundred thousand flaws or error, I'll weep. O oh, fool, I shall go mad. He refuses to weep. I don't know, would you ever trust a man who can, who can weep at nothing, that cannot let the tears flow, that refuses that wellspring of emotion to express grief, sorrow, tragedy? And he won't. So that repression of emotion will lead him to madness. And maybe that's Shakespeare, the psychotherapist, again. This presages his dissolving mental state that will not recover until he does weep. And that's the, that's connected in, throughout the play. So watch for that. Redemption needs pity, always a theme in Shakespeare, developed fully in The Tempest, which we may talk about later. So the gentleman, here again, a minor, minor character carrying the play, and often used as commentators. They're often like the Greek chorus, taking from the classical. The gentleman, a minor character of lower status, often used by uh, Shakespeare's chorus, reminds of the intensity of the storm. Where Lear is contending with the fretful element, bids the wind blow the earth into the sea, strives in this little world of man to outscorn the to and fro conflicting wind and rain. Act 3, scene 1, 4, 4 to 11. Lear's curses reflect the, the howling storm. They they imitate them. In other words, there's a pathetic fallacy. The crying storm, the screaming storm, is like the agony in Lear. It's called pathetic fallacy, if you want to look up those terms. Uh, nature reflects the state of man. Kent corroborates. Man's nature cannot carry the affliction nor the force. Act 3, scene 2, line 48. No one could withstand this. This is the storm of all storms. The dread for Lear in us must grow. Kent meets Lear very soon thereafter. Um, he meets him part way through. The, he doesn't follow him right away. Lear's out there on his own for a while, and then Kent comes along to support him. So the battered old man, so accustomed to op opulence, has been so reduced to nothingness that the smallest thing in this want seems um, a blessing, a gift. So he finds this pile of straw. He doesn't have a bed. He could be sleeping on rocks in the mud. Where is this straw, my fellow? And I love this line. The art of our necessities is strange that make vile things precious. If I were starving, a piece of moldy cheese might be so valuable. You're not going to get it. I'm keeping this, right? Moldy bread. I need something. That is precious. It makes a vile thing. That's the state he's at. Shakespeare expresses through this. So, these, this self-pity um, that has and sort of enveloped him, he will, will start to crack, to start to, to erode, and he will start to see it as a, 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 a universal condition. So the theme of social, out of his misery, comes a theme of compassion and empathy for others who suffer deprivation. And as the king, there were probably, you know, he'd look down and see lots of them. Uh, we see them today. Ten cities. Okay. In fact, the theme of social justice is evoked through the play, suggesting that justice may only arise from deprivation. All right? So I'm very comfortable. You know, I'm middle class. I've never had to go out and sleep in a storm in a tent in the middle of, uh, I don't know, some park in the city somewhere. I've never had to. I've never had to sit in the corner with a cup in my hand and say, please put in quarters so I can get, I don't know, go to Tim Hortons. However, this madness, his madness frightens him most at this point as he obsesses about his daughters. And he can't, he can't leave that behind yet. This tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats there, filial ingratitude. So he still cannot weep. He's still so angry 
that that's all he can feel. Oh, they, they did me dirty. They read it and I just hate them for it. Oh, that way madness. And he realizes that's the direction, that self-pity, that turning inward could lead to madness. That's Act 3, Scene 4, 13 to 20. With this line, his own mind is all. He has no thought anyone else. He's, his vanity has become self-pity. It dominates it. So, I have to here introduce another term, catharsis. With it comes the theme of social justice being established, and he does, he, he, he there is, a, there, I haven't said it yet, but there, it, there is coming this sense of pity for others, not pity for me, pity for others, seeming almost out of character. Know that the fool exits only for the next, the fool is in, and then the next speech I'm going to read, the fool goes away. Interesting. And then when the speech is over, he comes back. Why? What is it about that speech? We'll talk. So this the fool loses his role. For in the next speech, Lear discovers a truth. The fool is the truth teller when Lear is not. So once Lear discovers his own truth, the fool, perhaps as a figment of his imagination, need not be there. But when the speech is over, he comes back. It's not complete yet. Backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. So it's necessary <clears throat> at the final catharsis, which is the exhaustion of emotion through pity and fear that by the end of the play she felt so awful so fearful so and also so pitied and he will at the end <clears throat> there will be a redemption he will be an uplift out of that muck out of that storm out of that nihilism so that you'll come to the end and say oh my god was that was exhausting to be stretched both ways upwards downwards beside that's catharsis. So here's the first indication where he's going to discover a bit of his a bit of empathy, a little bit of a soul, a little bit of a light from above, a little peephole through that barrier he created where God's grace maybe may just leak through a little bit. So he says, the fear and the, the fear and the horror will be mixed with pity. So he looks at at uh, um, uh, the poor. He thinks of the poor, poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, that by the pelting of this pitiless night, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped, the body is broken, and window raggedness rips all through the clothes, defend you for such as these. And he says, and this is the kicker, oh, I have taken too little care of this. I'm guilty of negligence to my people. Holy smoke, this is, this is, what's happening here? Lear is not a static character. He's a very dynamic character. There are huge changes on the way through the play. Um, Lear is discovering his own conscience. And how can there be redemption without conscience? It intensifies the tragedy for this old vain narcissistic man at the end. When you see him recover, redeem, make restitution. You want Jesus, I want him to live. Too late. He has sealed his own fate and he cannot. His death, would, if, if, if he had never discovered his conscience and has never risen above the self-pity and the narcissism, well, his catastrophe would just be nemesis. It would just be, okay, well, that's fair. He did it to himself. But when he realizes he has a soul and you realize how tender that soul is at the end, you just wait. Wow. You, you, you cannot but be on his side. So it raises the question of the role of the fool. He is around only when the leader wants or lacks a conscience, so that in this contentious speech, he must be absent. I think we commented on that. 
So later, in Act, well, Act 3, Scene 4, just a bit later from what I've read, he says, and he's invoking the whole court, invoking human civilization, call it that. He says, take physic pomp, that is, take the medicine wealth, expose thyself to what wretches feel, that thou mayst shake the superflux, all this excess stuff you have, you can think of mega rich billionaires, etc. Shake the superflux. How many houses do you have to have? To them, share. It's very simple. And show the heavens more just. So you're doing it for God. And the, it's the little peep of light is coming through. Somehow, that barrier he created at the beginning of the play is being penetrated. This is, this is like a prayer. Take physic pomp, expose thyself to what wretches feel, that thou mayst shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. Act 3, scene 4, 31 to 34. So this goes beyond the bed of straw that make vile things precious. This is a passage of remorse, and he says, I should have taken uh, more care of this. It's a foreshadowing of his redemption at the end. The fool is absent for that speech and then returns. Truth. Truth was within Lear. The fool wasn't necessary. So, at this point, the journey through this dark night of the soul introduces Lear to the undisguised disguised uh, the oxymoron is, is, is deliberate. Edgar is Tom of Bedlam. <clears throat> uh, Bedlam is uh, chaos and ruination, etc., right? It's just a mess. It's chaos. Uh, it's also short for the term, uh, the word Bethlehem, which was the hospital for the insane. That would have been, in Shakespeare's time, that would have been Bedlam. So, he sees Tom Bedlam, and we haven't talked much about that story. Um, what has happened is there's uh, the, the Duke of Gloucester had two sons, illegitimate and legitimate. The, the Duke of Gloucester t tells us how happy he was to have committed adultery. He's really proud of it. Produced the illegitimate Edmund. Edmund is the nasty. Edmund tries to pull a fast trick on his good brother, Edgar. And Edgar has to run away to the heath. He's going to run into, he's just run into uh, to Lear. And Edgar is disguised as truth, naked man. You'd have a diaper on. So he becomes existential man. This is it. This is humanity. Naked on a heath suffering storms with no accommodation whatsoever. So, he says, Lear, <clears throat> Why thou art better in thy grave than to answer with the uncovered body this extremity of the skies. You'd be rather be dead than face this. Is man no more than this? The naked, dirty, grubby uh, Edgar as Tom Bedlam in a diaper. That's us, folks. Consider him well. Thou owest the worm no silk right you have you have no riches you have no fancy clothes the beast no hide you're not a warrior you're not wearing leather the sheep no wool you're not a serf or you're not a common man a peasant in your garment the cat no perfume right you have no fragrance about you except probably body smell Here's three ons are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. You are bare existential humanity. Unaccommodated man is no more. You have no accommodation. You haven't got a place. You've got food. You have got clothing. You've got you're unaccommodated. And you're unaccommodated by God's order. Lear took care of that. Unaccommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. That's us, folks. Is It's existential. Is man no more than this? The key word here is unaccommodated. We are accommodated in two ways. First, by material uh, comforts or satisfaction of needs varying by class. 
And second, the by the moral order preserved by God that Lear has dispelled. We have, by material things, take care of the animal nature, but also by God's grace, which takes care of the spiritual nature. It seems he has neither. Without either, man becomes merely the thing itself. For the divinely afforded social order is eradicated and has been by Lear. In the speech, Lear covers class, silk for the elite, the ecclesiastical, perhaps, or aristocratic, wearing fancy, beautiful clothes, imported, of course, leather or hide by the warrior class, and wool by the commoners. He has none. An accommodation obliterates all, all classes. Further, he doesn't belong to a class. Further implies the reality that these poor destitute men would not be unaccommodated if the moral order had been preserved. He would not be in chaos. So what's left but to pity him? There's learning, recovering. So his madness continues. Now he's back and forth. He doesn't suddenly, you know, have this epiphany and get up and say, oh, I'm okay now. However, the madness continues as he fantasizes the trial of his daughters. Next, and he goes, he falls back. And so he decides to make this poor ragged man with just rags on. You're going to play the judge. You know, is Shakespeare having fun? Uh, we're, we put on a lot of pretense, but really, that's all we are. Is this satire, the human judicial sphere? So, Tom of Bedlam may represent our pathetic judicial system, which is ever incomplete, Shakespeare may be suggesting. So, ju the ju judicial robes are some ratty blanket that Tom may be carrying around. So Shakespeare is always often the satirist, but he has a long way to go uh, to stop the anger and the self-pity. He has had moments, but they don't come to any conclusion by this time. So we are still, uh, and he's, um, he, he realizes later, it's in Act 4, Scene 5, 153, that he has lost the one daughter, the truth teller. And he says, that is the one daughter that redeems nature from the general curse. She's goodness. So he's, he's coming along. So the general curse, of course, being the original sin of pride, Adam or Lear's sin of pride at the beginning of the play. So And the assault on the moral order of the universe. Near the journey's end, he's re reunited with Cordelia. He tries to clear his mind, and he says, Where have I been? I am mightily abused. I should e'en die with pity to see another. Thus he talks about pity, he's not, not anger. In a moment of self-aware, self he admits, Pray do not mock, I am very foolish, fond old man. Fourscore and upward, he's over eighty. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. He has self-awareness, not narcissism, just my God. But my mind is not well. It's not, oh, I have my mind, and it should be, you know, what everybody else thinks. It's that's that's gone. Lear expresses both self-awareness and pity in ten lines. This is a far cry from his ravings with banished Kent and Cordelia and verbally savaged by his miscreant daughter. So what are what is left are the catastrophe and the catharsis. So I did mention earlier there is a parallel with Gloucester, the Duke of Gloucester, with sin of adultery, creating Edmund, creating Ed Edgar, Edgar the good legitimate, Edmund the bad illegitimate, who schemes with the daughters to get the kingdom, etc. And he plays one daughter off against the other. They both want him. They hate each other. And all that chaos and evil that has risen since the the, the, the bad deed. So... Um, so, uh, I was going to show you this one. Yes. The, when the monarch has, it, it, this is the human one, right? With the, um, the monarch, the royalty, the nobility, etc., on down. So now that, that the line is stopped here, the royal families are fighting with each other and more is coming up. Um, 
because Gloucester is still uh, relishing his sin, he has not been forgiven. Um, and it's not as bad a sin, perhaps, as, as, as Lear. He's not, it doesn't have the power to be that stupid. Uh, but still, it is a relish of, of his own adulterous past. Um, he's proud of the animal in himself. And there again, it's the animal nature now coming to fruition in the bad Edmund, who is greedy and avaricious and proud and all the rest of the bad things. His pride corrupted but led to adultery. So, um, Edmund rails, it's an interesting speech, Edmund rails against the norms of society, whereby he is very jealous. It's, uh, it's one of the seven deadly sins. He's very jealous of his good brother, Edgar, who is getting it all and is a legitimate son he has to get the title. Edmund the illegitimate can't. I mean, it's, 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 if you look at the, the court of, of George the fourth and his brother, uh, William the fourth, uh, they had all kinds of kids. They didn't have any legitimate heir. They were brothers. They both got the throne, no legitimate heir. And they had to go find one from another brother who was dead. And who do they find? Queen Victoria. Right. But with all those kids, not one legitimate from those two brothers. I think the mother is really upset about that, uh, Queen Charlotte. Um, anyway, so to, to go on, he in, invokes, Edmund does, when in, early in the speech, when he's saying, you know, I was created by passion. You know, what was Edgar created by? Some tired little bit of business that and no one had no passion in it right so he says you know if, if this great sport was in my making but he talks about and these righteous people from dull-eyed bed creating a whole tribe of fops got between uh, between asleep and awake so now gods stand up for bastards and it's very important here that he says gods it's pagan he doesn't say God. He says gods. Again, the morality of that. So the moral of nature suffers. He embraces appetites and he goes on for, to satisfy his own appetites with the two, two sisters and with his greed for more power and territory. And he would he would take the throne if he could get the right sister. And right. Um, so. Um, Edmund's passion commits him to crime, is survival of the fittest. Um, the themes of the subplot work in parallel to the main plot. Um, however, Gloucester's sin of lust as the original sin of the subplot is less than Lear's sin of pride, the origin of all sin, and he does that sort of hierarchy of sins. Um, Edmund has been very well thought of, and it is true. In King John, you have Philip de Cognac, who is the illegitimate son of Richard I, John's brother, has lots of them had were given little titles and little, little noble titles and, and land and all the rest, but they could not take, he could not become the Duke of Gloucester when his brother is alive. He would never become the Duke of Gloucester and take the major estate. Uh, but some of them did very well, and they were quite appreciated at court. You can look at them. Look up this, the the children of uh, of George uh, George the Fourth, and see who they are. They married well. They did well, etc. But they didn't become king. Um. So the subplot and the main plot work in tandem, and Lear and Gloucester meet on the heath where Lear has been abandoned to the heath and blinded by one of the sisters and her husband, uh, Cornwall. And it, 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 they are these two tragic figures who have been ruined by their own making and by the corruption that followed. Um, it's very much a morality play. I mean, these, these plays often are. They're not that far from the medieval world that they're not writing morality plays to some degree as, as, as background. Okay, so I think we can move on there. Um, so the the parallels uh, these are there are parallels humanity between the main plot and subplot. As order collapses, Lear accuses and rants in terms of orders and animal nature, unprotected by God's grace. As Edmund has. Um, 
his way, and he is the vile sinner, the lower motives of adulterous lust, avarice, and cruelty engulf the characters in the story. Blindness, murder, homelessness, wrath, jealousy, a myriad of venal and carnal sins infect the king as blind Gloucester, who's, who is uh, blinded and set on the heath because he was loyal to Lear, is loosed to chaos upon the heath, exacerbated by... Edmund's playing one desperate sister off against the other in a grotesque, grotesque sexual competition polluted by ambition. The animal nature seems to be triumphant. However, from Dover comes the French army with Cordelia. So, uh, I'm not going to go into the, the, the um, Gloucester story. It would take us too far to the side. Uh, but Lear and uh, Cordelia comes in to save Lear, and he meets her, And but then they are taken prisoner by the nasty forces. Uh, and towards the end, uh, the Lear and Cordelia are captured in the climactic scene. Du Edgar duels with and kills his brother, Edmund, the bad guy. We learn of the death of Gloucester. Goneril poisons Regan out of jealousy over Edmund and then kills herself when her treachery is revealed to Albany, her husband, who has actually maintained some integrity along the way. Edmund's betrayal of Cordelia leads to her needless execution in prison, and Lear finally dies out of grief of Cordelia's passing. Albany, uh, Edgar, and the elderly Kent are left to take care of the country under a cloud of sorrow and regret. So you get this always in Shakespeare in the last act. You get this wrapping up. So you have at the end, by the way, um, this purgation of emotions. And I want to read you um, one thing here. Yes. So Lear, in his speech as he carries the dead uh, he, no as as he is, sort of meets with cordelia before before the speech when she's dead um he he summarizes what it means to to recover morality and he says and this follows directly from the poor naked wretched speeches right he he now understands what really matters and so he says um Instead of destroying the world, smite flack the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's mold. He, he wants the total destruction um, and all Germans spill at once that make ungrateful man. That's gone. That hate. Redemption is still coming. So he has this epiphany and he says to Cordelia in prison. And this speech uh, is it's, 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 it's really quite wonderful. He says, no, 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 no. Come. Let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. And so we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news. Oh, and we'll talk with them too. And who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out, and take upon us the mystery of things, as if we were God's spies. And we'll wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. And all these important people will come and go. We'll watch them, we'll talk to them, but we will not be of them. He's done this. And that's why it's so tragic. You could cry. And if you, you got to cry at the end of this. You, because he has rediscovered a purity after his foolishness, his foolish narcissistic pride. He's come this far. He can pass now away in good soul. Maybe that's the object of everything. I don't know. There would be in the world but not of the world. We'll talk to them, chit-chat, and they'll come and go, and then the next crowd. But he will be a participant observer. His error was his establishing himself as a man in and of the world only. Sans grace, sans pity, sans God. 
His ultimate epiphany is his redemption. What more could I say that would do that speech justice? So, enjoy the play. So thank you all for enjoying the lecture. I hope you continue to enjoy the further lectures that I've prepared. And I hope they will serve the theater goers, the students, and the new teachers. If you have joined, uh, enjoyed the presentation, please press the like. And if you can, subscribe. Thank you.